uh, listen, I have a little heavy sermon. Um, it's a little hard, and then it gets harder, but it gets always gets better at the end, all right? So you're going to stay with me this morning, hang in there, receive from the Word of God. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word of God that proceeds from the mouth of God. So let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 together and talk about breaking bad. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you brothers not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, some report or letter that was supposed to have come to us saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I told you about these things, and now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. Jump down to verse 13. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers, loved by God, by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold on to the teachings that we passed on to you, whether we preached it to you or wrote it to you in our letter. Come on, let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to come help us. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people you love so much. I pray that you'd come breathe life among us. The letter kills, but the words you give our spirit and life. Lord, I just pray that you'd refresh, revive our spirits. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, has anyone ever said to you, I don't want you to panic, but... And then they go on and tell you some news about which it is impossible not to panic. I remember one Sunday morning, uh, one of our classrooms downstairs caught on fire. Someone threw out a sterno that was still lit, and it started a fire in the classroom. And I didn't know anything about it until all the services were over. And Pastor Faith said to me, I don't want you to panic, but there was a fire downstairs this morning don't panic. I, I had visions of everybody running out of the building before I could take the offering that morning. <laughs> I'm going to skip that in one service so we can put it on YouTube, all right? <clears throat> but there was this one summer that in college that I was working at this Christian retreat in the Poconos, and I just sat down for breakfast with a bunch of my coworkers, and the girl sitting immediately next to me turned her head ever so slightly, and I swear to you, the biggest spider I have ever seen in my life was like right on the crown of her head. It was an enormous daddy long legs, and this thing was so huge, it literally covered the entire top of her head. And so I said to her, Beth, don't panic, but the biggest spider I have ever seen is on top of your head. And she let out a blood-curdling scream that sent the entire cafeteria into a panic. Sometimes, no matter how hard we try, we end up causing a panic. And that is definitely the case with Paul's letters to the Thessalonians. When Paul picked up his pen and began to write to the Christians in the Greek city of Thessalonica, he did something that had never been done before. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul began to write the first letter from heaven. Letters commissioned by God to speak to Christians everywhere in every generation. The first letter to the believers in Thessalonica was meant to cause them encouragement, comfort, especially about the coming of the Lord. Brothers, we don't want you to be ignorant, Paul wrote. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud battle cry, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and left will be caught up together to, in the clouds to meet the Lord, and so shall we ever be with him. Those words were written to be a comfort. 
Some Christians had died in the city of Thessalonica, and apparently the believers who were left were afraid that those who had died were going to miss out on the blessing of the second coming of Jesus. So Paul wrote to reassure them that those who have passed on ahead of us in Christ will have a front row seat when Jesus comes back. But inadvertently, Paul sent the Thessalonians into a panic when he wrote these words. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come upon them suddenly as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Now their worry shifted from their deceased loved ones to themselves. They were worried about missing the second coming. They were worried that perhaps they had already missed it. You know, there was a time in my life when I worried about that too. I remember hearing sermons as a kid about the second coming of Jesus, and I literally thought, I was eight years old, I literally thought that these words meant that I wasn't supposed to sleep at night, lest I should miss the rapture. I, I didn't understand that the sleep the Bible is talking about is spiritual apathy, drifting away from Jesus. So I can actually remember lying in bed at night as a kid praying and asking the Lord to forgive me because I was sleepy and drifting off to sleep. You know, every Pentecostal kid that I knew went through at least one rapture scare in his life. Anybody, anybody here ever go through a rapture scare where, you know, people weren't where you thought that they were supposed to be and you, all of a sudden you were afraid you'd... Anybody else? Come on. I, 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 I we'll find out the true Pentecostals in the room right now. Carla, it's me and you. We, I, I know. <laughs> Pastor, uh, 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 yeah. There was a lot of anxiety about the second coming of the Lord. Somehow, word got back to Paul that his first letter caused a panic. So Paul sat down to wrote, write a follow-up letter, 2 Thessalonians. Here in chapter 2, Paul is again speaking about the second coming of Jesus. And ironically, he starts with the words, don't panic. And then he goes straight on to describe the evil end-time reign of the Antichrist. I don't know what effect Paul's letter had on the Thessalonians directly, but I can tell you that his words here have been causing panic in the church ever since. Don't panic, but pure evil is coming on the earth, the likes of which has never been seen before. Don't panic, but many are going to be deceived and perish. Beth, don't panic, but the biggest spider I've ever seen is on your head. Bible scholars agree that 2 Thessalonians 2 is probably the most difficult passage in all of Paul's letters. One reason is that Paul keeps referring to things that he had verbally told the Thessalonians about which were completely in the dark. He keeps saying, remember that I told you. Well, they knew what Paul had said, but we don't. Another reason is that Paul talks about some things here that he discusses nowhere else in his letters, which is unusual. Uh, a third reason that this passage is difficult is that when Paul got excited, he tended not to finish his scent. You know what I... Yeah, that's, the pa that's the case. Uh, yeah. In 400 A.D., St. Augustine threw up his hands about this passage of Scripture and said, I have to admit, I just don't know. And sometimes we have to do the same, but don't panic, because there's still a lot we can know from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In fact, looking at Paul's words, I see three truths that I want to share with you quickly this morning. Three truths from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. First this, don't panic, but the spirit of Antichrist is busily at work in the world today. Don't panic, but the spirit of Antichrist is already at work. The identity of the Antichrist has been the subject of wild speculation all through church history. Early Christians thought that perhaps it was the Roman emperor, maybe the Visigoth leader that conquered Rome. Some people thought that Muhammad was the Antichrist. Some people thought the popes were the Antichrist. Some people thought that the reformer Martin Luther was the Antichrist. More recently, Hitler and Joseph Stalin. In my own lifetime, there have been many supposed antichrists. Nikita Khrushchev, Henry Kissinger, you remember that one? Jim Jones, Ronald Wilson Reagan, you know, each one of his names has six letters, 666. Gorbachev, who had the scar on his head, David Koresh, Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, Barack Hussein Obama, Gaddafi, Bashar, and the list goes on and on. Obviously, none of these people are the Antichrist, 
but it wouldn't be inaccurate to call some of them Antichrist or of the Antichrist spirit. See, Paul says that there is a demonic power at work in the world today that is setting the stage for the things to come at the end of human history. Paul calls it the secret power of lawlessness. What is this power and how does it operate? Paul doesn't give us a lot of detail here, but there are some other scriptures that help us. John said, Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. You know, Christ is not a name. Christ is a title that belongs to Jesus. It means the Messiah, the anointed one. So Jesus Christ is Jesus the Messiah. And anti in Greek, it means against, but it also means in place of or instead of. And the Antichrist is both of those things. The Antichrist spirit is against Jesus. John says that the Antichrist spirit denies that Jesus is the one and only Son of God. It denies the unique relationship in the Godhead between the Father and the Son. On the Temple Mountain in Jerusalem, there's a Muslim mosque with a golden dome. Perhaps you've seen photos of it. It's very, very famous and inscribed in Arabic twice around the inner circumference of that dome are the words, God has no son. God has no son. That is the Antichrist spirit. John says it denies Jesus is the Messiah. It denies that God has come in the flesh, that the Messiah has come. The Antichrist spirit is against Jesus, and its ultimate goal is to put a counterfeit Messiah in the place of Jesus. So how does the Antichrist spirit operate? Certainly this isn't exhaustive, but let me give you a couple of quick things here. First of all, the Antichrist spirit incites hatred all over the world for Jesus and his followers. You know, a prime example of that hatred would be the persecution of Christians in the 20th century in the Soviet Union and still today in Red China and in North Korea and in Laos. Muslims are slaughtering Christians from Algeria to Indonesia, from Kazakhstan to Somalia and everywhere in between. Hindus and Buddhists attack Christians from India to Cambodia. And here in the Western world, the intense hatred of atheists for Jesus and for Christians is fueled by the Antichrist spirit. If you ever run across an atheist or run across any, any of the stuff that they put out, did, did it ever strike you how ferocious their anger is? And, and how illogical it really is. I mean, what's it to them if, if I'm deluded by a myth? Why so angry? Why the vile language? Why the hate-filled insults that they, that they put upon us? I will tell you that it rises above the level of human hatred. It is fueled by a demonic spirit. It's fueled by the Antichrist spirit. You know, America has crossed over the threshold where Christian expression is now blatantly suppressed. I have been asked not to pray in the name of Jesus at public events and here in the town of Greenwich. One of my precious friends, Mike Modica in Florida, was invited by the governor to pray at a state dinner, but he received a phone call a couple days ahead from one of the governor's aides asking him not to use the name of Jesus in his prayer. And when my friend Mike said, I can't do that, he was uninvited by the governor. Franklin Graham was uninvited from the national prayer breakfast because he refused to omit the name of Jesus out of his prayer. I want to tell you that is the work of the Antichrist spirit. Beloved, listen, the jokes of late night comedians, the television shows and movies that make us out to be illiterate and unintelligent and unenlightened, news commentaries uh, that label us as religious extremists, I want to tell you, don't naively dismiss that stuff as humor or as political spin. Behind that is a ferocious demonic spirit that hates Jesus. And make sure that you don't partner with it. How does the Antichrist spirit operate? The Antichrist spirit, secondly, introduces counterfeit forms of spirituality 
to lure people away from worshiping Jesus. Paul and John and Jesus all said that the Antichrist spirit works through spiritual deception. It introduces religious notions and religious experiences that appear noble on the outside, but inwardly are rotten to the core. The Antichrist spirit promotes false religions under the guise of bringing people inner peace, bringing people physical wellness, harmonious relationships. You know, Paul said that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light and his servants as servants of righteousness. Over the last few decades, there has been an explosion in America of spiritism and idolatry that is fueled by the Antichrist spirit. How many of you in your workplace have been asked to attend a seminar that was like new agey, ooga booga-ish, you know, introducing, they come in feng shui your office, uh, Zen, meditation, yoga, tai chi, martial arts, fascination with crystals and objects, uh, sacred objects, Eastern religions. A couple of weeks ago, the students at Greenwich High School during their midterms were invited to go down to the gym and receive a massage from Reiki energy healers who call on spirit guides, which are really nothing more than demonic spirits of deception, and get a nice massage to help relax them during midterms. Imagine if I had asked to set up a booth at the gym to pray for students for the peace of Christ. What do you think might have happened? That's the Antichrist spirit at work. And beloved, listen, the, the practitioners of these false religions, they, they actually perform real healings. This is not smoke and mirrors. This is not magician's tricks. They actually perform real spiritual phenomena, but they come with a high price tag of deception and ultimately destruction. Among Christians, the Antichrist spirit replaces the real Jesus Christ with what Paul calls another Jesus. Many churches today preach a distorted Jesus. The real facts of whose life are relegated to mere symbolism. This Jesus was not God come in the flesh, born of a virgin. This Jesus did not do miraculous signs and wonders. He didn't rise again to life on the third day. This Jesus is nothing more than one big metaphor for selflessness and kindness and, and lofty ethical goals. This Jesus promotes a sentimental love with no regard for the righteousness of God or the eternal destiny of men's souls. This Jesus is but one of many paths to the destination called enlightenment. I was part of a funeral a while back ago at a Christian church here in Greenwich, and uh, when the minister got up to start the service, she started with the words, God who is called by many names. In other words, by the name of many different gods all around the world. That is the work of the Antichrist spirit. But listen, don't panic. How does the Antichrist spirit operate? The Antichrist spirit instigates rebellion against God through promoting every kind of unrighteousness. Beloved, the Antichrist spirit is the spirit of lawlessness. It rejects God's rule. It rejects God's authority. It rejects God's order. It rejects God's righteousness that's described here in the Bible. You know, Jesus was the ultimate personification of the righteousness in the Bible. Jesus fulfilled all the law. His beautiful, sinless life was a, a living picture of all the righteousness of God that is written in this book. Jesus was completely humble. He was completely submitted to God. He was completely obedient to God. The Antichrist spirit is the precise opposite of that. And the goal of the Antichrist spirit is to incite men to rebel against God's authority by committing acts of unrighteousness of every kind, but especially, I want to say, acts of sexual impurity. Paul describes the work of the Antichrist spirit in the last hour when he writes to Timothy, but mark this, listen, in the last days, demonically ferocious times will come. People will be lovers of themselves. Narcissists, lovers of money, greedy, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to parents. Do you ever hear the way kids talk to uh, their parents these days? You know what, even sometimes my own kids, you know, they let something out. And honestly, if I had said something like that to my grandfather, I would have been drop kicked into next year. <laughs> my grandparents went to the backhand school of parenting, you know. We would have never dared. 
but it's the spirit of the age. Come on now. Ungrateful. You hear about the teenage girl suing her parents for college tuition. Unholy. Without natural family affection. That means without natural male-female love. Husband-wife love. Parent-child love. Unforgiving. Without self-control. Brutal. Conceited. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I skipped a bunch of words because I just can't take it anymore. All you need to do is open your Bible to 2 Timothy 3 and sit down in front of the headlines and you will see the manifestation of the Antichrist spirit in our culture today. And I want to tell you, as we race towards the end of human history, it's intensifying. We live in the demonically ferocious times that Paul described, but don't panic. Three truths from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The spirit of Antichrist is busily at work in the world. And the second truth, now it's going to get even worse, all right? But it'll get better at the end, so hang on. The second truth is this. Don't panic, but a man of lawlessness will emerge on the world stage near the end of human history. Some of the Thessalonian believers were panicking because they thought they had missed the second coming. They thought they had missed the rapture. But Paul said, don't panic. Two things must happen before the day of the Lord comes. The rebellion must occur, and the man of lawlessness must appear. What is the rebellion? The, the word there for rebellion is the word apostasy in Greek. And some people think it, it means a believers falling away from the church. But along with others, I believe that this will be a worldwide political and religious movement that is in direct defiance of God and of the Lord Jesus. The psalmist prophesied this in Psalm 2, the kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one, that's Jesus. Let us break off their chains, they say. Let us throw off their fetters. In other words, they reject God's authority over them. Daniel and, Revelation, and the book of Revelation prophesy about a coalition of ten kings who will come in the end and will give their authority over to the Antichrist. Revelation also indicates that those ten kings are united and controlled by a worldwide religious movement, maybe a coming together of all the world's religions. We don't know, uh, under the pretense of harmony and peace, all the while martyring true lovers of Jesus. But don't panic. Along with the rebellion comes the man of lawlessness. Last fall, Pastor Nick taught a series called Things to Come on Wednesday evenings, and he talked extensively one night about the Antichrist. You can go on the YouTube channel and pick up that session. We're going through the book of Revelation right now on Wednesday evenings, and we will be coming shortly to Revelation chapter 11, chapter 12, chapter 13 that discusses the Antichrist. But I want to just give you quickly six things that Paul says here in 2 Thessalonians 2 about the Antichrist. Six things real quick. Number one, he will emerge on the world stage at a time that has been set by God. He will emerge when God says so. There's a lot of disagreement about the precise meaning of Paul's words in these verses, especially when he talks about what restrains the Antichrist from appearing. Not everyone agrees about what that means, but everyone does agree that ultimately it's God's timing that determines all the events of human history. It turns out that restraining or holding back the Antichrist might not be the best translation of Paul's words here. His words also mean holding on to influence or, or holding on. Rather than referring to a good force holding back evil, it might be that Paul is referring to Satan trying to hold on to his access to heaven. Revelation says that halfway through the seven-year period we call the tribulation, Michael the archangel will cast Satan out of heaven once and for all. When Satan is cast down to the earth, a loud voice will shout in heaven, Thank God and Greyhound, that accuser of the brethren, he's gone. And then it will shout, Look out below. Because being confined to the earth, Satan will turn his full fury onto the Jewish people and onto Christians. And that is when the Antichrist will emerge on the world stage, empowered by Satan, but don't panic. Six things about the Antichrist. Second, he will be evil incarnate, a man thoroughly energized by Satan. The Antichrist will be the precise opposite of everything that Jesus is. 
Just as Jesus is the perfect embodiment of God's righteousness, the Antichrist will be the perfect embodiment of sin and rebellion. He will be brutal. He will be vile. He will be malicious. He will be murderous. He will be grossly immoral. Paul calls him the son of perdition. That's a title that Jesus gave to Judas Iscariot. It means that his will will be thoroughly given over to the control and the purposes of Satan. But don't panic. Six things about the Antichrist. Third, he will dazzle all the people of the earth with counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. Paul describes the appearance of the Antichrist with the same words that he uses to describe the appearance of Jesus, a perusa, a, a, an apocalypsis. That means that the Antichrist is going to burst onto the world stage and he will amaze and he will impress the people of the earth. And he will perform real miracles and spiritual phenomena. These are not parlor tricks. These are not smoke and mirrors. They will be the real deal. Paul calls them counterfeit, not because they're fake, but because the source is from Satan. And all the unbelievers on the earth will be deceived by them, but don't panic. Six things about the Antichrist. You holding out okay? Because when we get to six, you'll shout a little bit. So we just got to get through four and five. So hang on there with me. Six things about the Antichrist. Number four, he will set up a throne in the Holy of Holies. He will proclaim himself to be God, and he will demand that all worship on earth be directed only to him. There's disagreement about whether the Antichrist will establish himself in a literal, in the literal temple, or whether this is metaphorical language. Along with others, I believe that Paul means a literal temple. For one thing, Paul uses a very specific word here that indicates the Antichrist will enter the Holy of Holies. Another thing is that Daniel and Jesus and John all describe this very same event in very literal terms. There's also a long list of other antichrists who have done precisely the same thing throughout history, and I believe that it was a foreshadow of the antichrist. The Babylonian commander, Nebuzaradan, desecrated the Holy of Holies. The Greek ruler, Antiochus Epiphanes, built an altar to Zeus in 169 BC, and he sacrificed a pig on that altar. This is Antiochus Epiphanes. He's dead, but Jesus is alive. The Roman gen general Pompey desecrated the Holy of Holies in 63 BC. The Roman Emperor Caligula planned to set up an image of himself in the Holy of Holies in 40 AD, but he died be before he could carry it out. The Roman general Titus in 70 AD set up an idol in the temple of God. And I believe all these things are foreshadows of what the Antichrist will do. When the Antichrist sets himself up in the temple, he will suppress every other kind of worship on earth, and he will demand that everyone worship him. The religion that had brought all the empires of the world together, the ten kings and the Antichrist will turn on that religion. They will betray that religion, and they will morph it into a religion of worship of the Antichrist, which Scripture says is the worship of Satan himself directly, but don't panic. Six things about the Antichrist. Number five, he will perpetrate Satan's last great deception on earth. Paul speaks here about the rebellion, the man of lawlessness, and the lie. God will send a powerful spirit of delusion to unbelievers so that they will believe the lie. Beloved, the doorway to the spirit of Antichrist is the rejection of the truth of Jesus and delight in righteousness. Listen to me. The decision not to make a decision about Jesus is a decision. The decision not to receive Jesus is the decision to reject him forever. And the sensuality and the sexual impurity proliferated by the Antichrist spirit opens the door to that spirit of delusion because it is blatant defiance to the righteous order of God in creation. But don't panic, because here's the sixth thing about the Antichrist. The final thing is, he will be consumed by the breath of Jesus' mouth when Jesus comes again in majestic splendor. <laughs> Beloved, the Antichrist will be a counterfeit Messiah in every way, but he will be no match for the true Messiah. 
Jesus Christ will come in a blazing manifestation of his divine glory. He will not appear in a remote desert place. He will not appear in a secret room inside a holy building, just like lightning lights up the entire sky and everyone who sees it, every eye shall behold him and all the nations of the earth will mourn because of him. And when he confronts the Antichrist, all Jesus will have to do is go, and he will come to his end, Daniel said, and no one will help him. The Antichrist and the false prophet who promoted him will be the first two to take the nesty plunge into the lake of fire. Don't panic because Jesus will triumph in the end. Three truths from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The Antichrist spirit is busy at work. The man of lawlessness will emerge on this stage. And the third truth is this. Don't panic, but get a good grip instead. Don't panic, but get a good grip instead. Worship team, come help me. I'm not sure that the church has a role in restraining the Antichrist from appearing. But I am sure that we can put the brakes on the influence of the Antichrist spirit in our own lives and in Jesus' church. In fact, Paul says we must do. We are responsible not to partner with the Antichrist spirit. We are responsible not to participate in the rebellious unrighteousness of the Antichrist spirit. I don't have time to elaborate this morning, but I want to just throw quickly at you five ways to put the brakes on the Antichrist spirit. Five ways to put the brakes on the Antichrist spirit. First of all, get a good grip on gratitude for your salvation. I'm so glad that we sang those words this morning. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your blood that cleanses me. It doesn't look like there's a lot of encouragement here. Paul says, don't panic. And then he writes about the most horrible, most awful evil things to come. But, but there really is a word of encouragement here because Paul says, God has a good grip on you. Remember last week we told you God made the right call about you. He made the right call when he chose you to be saved, when he chose you to be sanctified by the work of the Holy Spirit. God made the right call when he arranged for you to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and he enabled you to receive it. He made the right call when he destined you to share in Jesus' own glory. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, God has not appointed us to suffer the wrath of eternal punishment, but to receive salvation through Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we live or whether we die, we will live forever with him. Be grateful for that. Whatever might befall you, whatever you might be facing, whatever hardship, whatever challenge, whatever difficulty, whatever illness, whatever thing is in your way right now, put the helmet of the hope of salvation on your head and evaluate the experiences that you're going through through the hope of eternal life that you have in Jesus Christ. It won't last long. You'll be with him soon. Five ways to put the brakes on the Antichrist spirit. Second, get a good grip on the word of God. Beloved, listen to me. You and I, we must know the word. We must know what it says. We must understand what it says. We must embrace what it says, all of it. You have to eat the whole scroll. You have to eat the parts that taste sweet in the mouth. And you also have to eat the parts of the scroll that burn a little bit going down. That's why I'm teaching systematically through Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and Acts and now through the epistles of the New Testament because you have to eat the parts that you might never hear preached on television. That's good right there. I'm not bashing television preachers. Their goal is evangelistic. But we have to know what the whole Bible says. See, the way Satan works is through twisting the word of God. When he came to Eve, what was the first thing that he said? Did God really say? 
And then he misrepresented God's words and he tripped her all up. When Satan confronted Jesus, what was the first thing he said? Doesn't the scripture say? And he conveniently omitted the parts that burn going down. Jesus withstood Satan because Jesus knew what the Bible actually says. And he understood what it meant and he loved it and he embraced it. Beloved, listen to me. Learn the word. We are living in the demonically ferocious times that Paul described. I hate to be the bearer of bad news this morning, but I want to tell you the only way to counteract it is you must learn the word. You must read the word. You must study the word. You must memorize the word. You must embrace Embrace the word. Listen, invest in the word. You're just not getting enough Bible in your diet. Forget stupid American Idol. Who cares who wins? Come to the house of God on Wednesday evening and hear some of the best teaching you'll ever hear on the book of Revelation so that you know what the word of God says. Ooh, I'm being a little tough now. Ooh. And listen, we have the Holy Spirit to help us. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will help us remember everything Jesus taught. What that means is that in that moment that we're tested, in that moment that the enemy comes with a deception, the Holy Spirit will help us to discern between what is aligned with the truth of this word and between what is counterfeit. Five ways to put the brakes on the Antichrist spirit. Third, get a good grip. This is a good one right here. You, you might need to get the CD and listen to it again before you realize how good it really is. Number three, get a good grip on a mature theology of suffering. Don't have time to elaborate. But beloved, we need to be settled in our hearts. We need to be settled in our minds that suffering is a part of God's process in our Christian journey on the earth. See, what confused the Thessalonians in part was the extreme persecution they were suffering. They, they thought that, I, I must have missed it. I, I must have done something wrong. I, I must be missing something because surely God would not allow me to go through this much suffering. That's why they thought perhaps they had missed the rapture and they were living in the time of the tribulation. But the New Testament says that God not only allows us to suffer, but that suffering is part of his process in our lives. Listen, that's meat for the mature. Paul told the Thessalonians, we were destined for trials and persecutions. We told you that. He said, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Everyone who wants to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. The writer of Hebrews says, God uses hardships as discipline in our lives. Not punishment, but training in righteousness. Can I tell you, that doesn't jive with some popular theologies today. Some people just refuse to believe that God allows, even uses sickness and suffering as his instruments. The Bible says it was God himself who tested Job with calamity. Even all the horrific events coming at the end of the age, they only happen with God's permission. God is in control the entire time. Beloved, listen to me. This is a little tough right here. I hope you'll love me still next week. But listen, it's time to give up happy, clappy, fast food theology and to embrace the true spiritual meat of the word. He knows the way that I take, and when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Five ways to put the brakes on the Antichrist spirit. Number four, get a good grip on humility, complete submission, and joyful obedience to God. The Antichrist spirit is a spirit of lawlessness. It hates the rule of God. It hates the righteousness of God. The open door to the deception of the Antichrist spirit is willful disobedience to God. Willful disobedience is when I say, you know, I don't care what the Bible says. I'm just going to go with what feels right to me. It's when we conveniently ignore 
looking at those parts of Scripture that might challenge us or might confront us, you know? Just read your, your little book of Bible promises and, and never read the parts that might just hit you right in between the eyes and make you drop to your knees. Pastor Nick shared brilliantly a couple of weeks ago uh, about wherever we're making excuses in our life is precisely the place where we need to get on our knees and we need to just say, Jesus, I surrender again to you. Delighting in unrighteousness is when we affirm and celebrate the lifestyles of people who are living in open defiance to God's created order. The way to counteract the Antichrist spirit is through humility. It's through repentance. It's through continually surrendering to Jesus. And listen, the Holy Spirit works in our heart to make obedience to God a joyful thing to us. What does Paul say? For it is God who works in you first to, who knows the word, first to will and then to do his good pleasure. So the Holy Spirit works inside of your heart to make obedience to the word of God, not a burden, but something you want to do and then you do it. Five ways to put the brakes on the Antichrist spirit. Don't panic because I'm done after this. Number five, get a good grip on the difference between what appears to be good and what is truly of God. Beloved, listen to me. Not all that glitters is gold. Not all that glitters is gold. Not everything that appears to be good on the surface is truly from God. And it's so important in the times that we live that we know the difference. The physical cures of spiritual healers appear to be good, but they are not from God. The wellness benefits of yoga and Tai Chi and all those other things, they appear to be good, but they are not from God. The prosperity and success brought on by the incantations of urban shamans and feng shui masters, they appear to be good, but they're not from God. The good works of some people appear to be good, but they're not from God. And beloved, it's no good to shrug our sh shoulders and say, you know, I really don't care about the spiritual roots of that. As long as it's helping people, I I'm fine with it. The temporal help that it brings people is an open door to a spirit of deception that will lead to eternal destruction. The Antichrist spirit has flooded our society with a tidal wave of unsanctified sentimentality. Listen, hold on, because I'm almost done. I got three breaths and I'm done. Listen to me. The brand of love that the Antichrist spirit puts out is a counterfeit love that affirms people's sins all the way to the gates of hell. The message of the cross is not express yourself, it's deny yourself and follow Jesus. C.S. Lewis said, love is not an affectionate feeling, but rather a steady wish for the loved person's ultimate good so far as it can be obtained. You know, only Jesus loved us enough to tell us the truth. To a woman at the well, he said, go call your husband, husband number five or six or seven, whatever it was, go, go call your husband because Jesus wanted to touch her at the point of brokenness in her life. To a woman caught in adultery, Jesus lifted her up and he said, go and sin no more. To a paralyzed man, he said, son, your sins are forgiven you. To a transformed prostitute, he said, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. That's why she loves so much. You see, Jesus doesn't express his love by overlooking our sin. He expresses our love by faithfully addressing our sin and mercifully removing it. In Jesus, mercy and truth are met together in a divine moment where all at once we are convicted of our need for God and convinced of his incredible love for us. And Jesus has given us the Holy Spirit to help us to discern the root and the ultimate fruit of popular ideas and movements. John said, test the spirits to see whether they're from God. A spirit is an inspired idea. It's an inspired proposition of truth or of so-called truth. And the Word of God and the Holy Spirit help us to test the ideas that are being put in front of us, whether they're from God. What is the root of the idea and what is the ultimate fruit of the idea and the philosophies? Three truths from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 
Don't panic. The spirit of Antichrist, it is at work. Don't panic. The man of lawlessness, he will emerge. But listen, don't panic. Instead, get a good grip and rejoice because God has a good grip on you. Would you stand up and would you give Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, a great big hand in this place. Come on, let's give Jesus a great big praise.